is the front line of women's leadership. There's a lot of front lines. How are we doing? Are they far enough in front, right? Are the front lines in the CEO in the suite? Is it the boardroom? Is it the front of refugee camps, um, men and women dynamics, right? There's lots of front lines that we're going to talk about today. And the challenge for us in this context is to have an intimate conversation. The last thing that we need is to have yet another conversation that doesn't say anything new. So the challenge before us is how do we share what we're learning at the front lines from the work we're doing, from the challenges to get to scale, to have impact, because that's what we're trying to push, the front lines. What we're going to do in a few moments is hear from some great speakers who are going to kick off this conversation, and they'll speak for a few minutes and give us some context about their work. And then after that, we're going to turn the work back over to all of us, and we'll have a dialogue for about 50 minutes around what's happening on the issues, what are you learning, what are you challenged by, and where are you learning about how to operate differently than what we did a year ago. And we hope this will be a dynamic conversation with all of us. We also know that this is a complicated conversation, because some of the front lines are in our own heads and how we think and operate on these issues. And at the same time, we know other front lines are systemic problems. We have a lot of data that shows the power of women in leadership and what that can do. And yet data and having champions is also not enough of where we're trying to go. And so we want to bring all of that into our conversation today. But before that, I want to introduce our speakers. First, we have Kay Krill, the president and CEO of Ann Inc., who will share and then bring some of her friends to talk about the work they're doing. Hello, everyone. I never ever dreamed of becoming a leader or a CEO of a public company. It was definitely never in my thoughts or dreams. But here I am, one of the 35 or 3% of CEO female leaders of the Fortune 1000. And I wish there were more. Um, and I want to make a difference. I feel it is my responsibility as a female leader to help young women develop the confidence to know that they can be anything they want to be. And that includes being a leader. Believe it or not, there are still struggles today with young girls believing they cannot rise to top leadership roles. And we need to do our part to change that perception. A study was recently conducted at Princeton and other Ivies regarding this issue. The results showed that girls are not raising their hands in class or going for the leadership roles in school like they should be. They take the secondary position and let their male peers be the leader. This has to change. I know in my case, at CEO events, whether they are conferences or dinners, I am always the only female CEO in the room. So I want and need to do my part to help develop and mentor young girls and women to be the next generation of female leaders. This has become my passion. So three years ago, we developed Ann Power Initiative in partnership with Vital Voices to address this challenge. Vital Voices has been an amazing partner in making us implement and execute this initiative. And I'd like to give a shout out to Elise Nelson, who is the CEO of Vital Voices and has been an amazing friend and partner. Together, we decided to focus on rising sophomore and junior high school girls who already have the passion to make a difference in their communities and are not afraid to lead. We select 50 girls per year to be in our program, and of course, we get thousands of applications. We are striving to help these girls create their important network early in life. Every spring, we have a forum in Washington, and the girls have an amazing week of leadership training and mentoring. We invite key female leaders in the Vital Voices Global Network to provide the girls with a global perspective. 
We also had them spend time with female leaders in the U.S. during that week, including myself and key leaders in Washington. This year, they had the pleasure and honor to meet Hillary Clinton, Valerie Jarrett, Rosie Rios, and Kate Hudson. What an inspirational week for all of us. It has become my favorite event of the year. Our company has invested $1.3 million to support this initiative. In addition to teaching leadership skills, we provide grants to the girls that they use to impact approximately 5,500 people per year in their collective communities through their efforts. That is impressive and makes me very proud. Last year at this conference, we announced our commitment to create an Ann Power Advisory Council made up of successful women who could serve as role models and mentors. Our Ann Power Advisory Council is just one of the ways we are mobilizing our fellows for impact. And I'm thrilled to have one of our dedicated council members here with me today, Kate Hudson. Kate is not only a successful actor, she's a great mother and is our brand ambassador for Ann Taylor. She is passionate about women's issues and was definitely an inspiration to our Ann Power fellows this past spring. I am so proud to know Kate, to call her a friend, and so appreciate her involvement in Ann Taylor. Kate. Thank you, Kay. Hi. Um, I'm here today because last April I had the opportunity to mentor 50 and Power Fellows while they attended their three-day leadership training program in D.C. It was an amazing experience to get to speak to these extraordinary girls, and they are extraordinary, who want to make a real difference in the world. As part of helping these girls develop their leadership potential, it is so important for them to have role models and mentors that will inspire them to continue on their path to leadership. It is an honor for me to be able to be there to support them, and I'm here today in support of Monica. Uh, Monica is a 2012 Ann Power Fellow and grant recipient from Boulder, Colorado. She's passionate about changing the world through technology, and we know that she'll do just that. She's already made an impact closing the gender gap in technology fields. For her Ampower project, Monica ran workshops for elementary school girls to get them interested in careers in computer science and engineering. Her project touched on a lot of themes that the other fellows were interested in, empowering girls through mentoring and education, encouraging interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. So she graduated high school with high honors and prestigious scholarships, and she is now in her first year at Harvard this fall. So it is my pleasure to introduce our grant winner, Monica. Hi, I'm Monica. I am a 2012 Ann Power Fellow and a 2012 Ann Power grantee. And growing up, I never really understood the need for women's empowerment, which is a very cheeky thing to say at a conference like this. But um, what would happen is I would look outside and I would see that almost half of the population were women. So it only made sense to me that half of the leaders would also be women. But as I grew up and I got more involved in STEM, I realized just how detrimental the fact that that's not true actually was. So in my sophomore year, I actually took AP Computer Science. And out of 30 students, I was the one and the only girl in that class. And I thought, well, I'm very confident. Like, this should be fine. I mean, I've gone to school with these kids for six or seven years. But it was amazing to me just how amazed they would be when I would raise my hand in class and answer a question right. Like, they would look at me when I would walk in wearing a dress as if I were some sort of alien. Like, what is she doing here? She doesn't belong. And I thought to myself, it takes a special kind of woman to go into STEM. It takes a special kind of woman to consistently feel the pressure to prove that she's not inferior to the others. But then I thought, why? Like, why should women have to put on this facade or this acting? Or they should, how, why should they try and have to consistently prove themselves? 
So that's why I became passionate in closing the gender gap. And my passion wasn't really going anywhere until I went to this Ann Power Forum and I met my mentor, Kawala, who is an amazing politician in Cameroon and an amazing businesswoman. And what Ka showed me is what true mentorship is. Because it always seemed like one of those buzzwords that people throw at you. But she showed me that mentorship isn't someone standing behind you telling you what your next step should be or what exactly you should do. Instead, a mentor is someone who gives you the confidence to have your voice be heard. Because they had their voices be heard when they were being subdued. And because of that, I know that I have every right to let my message be heard and let my talents be shown and that I'm not inferior. So my project um, was, as Kate mentioned, I was working with workshops with fourth and fifth grade girls, and I only reached about 75 women, um, which is nowhere near the targeted population. But what else Ka taught me through my mentorship with her and my involvement with Ann Power is that sometimes it's not the sweeping legislation or the education reform that matters, but it's about the little things. So if I even inspired one or two of the girls in my workshop to go out and continue their passions in STEM and to go out and inspire other women, then I've done my job. Because then they will go out and inspire two or three more, and they'll go out and inspire two or three more, and then we have this beautiful ripple effect of change. I alone cannot bridge this gender gap in the, in the field of STEM, but I know that if I continue to inspire others the way that my Ann Power mentors, the way Kay Krill, Kate Hudson, Kawala have all inspired me, then I have done a job and I can make a difference and together we can make the world a better place. Thank you. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> Thank you, Monica and Kate. This program would not be what it is without great partners and amazing participants. As we conclude, I would like to share with you all a few lessons we learned when we developed our Ann Power initiative. First, invest in programs that are authentic to your company. Your programs have to be true to your purpose and values as a company. Find what your clients and associates are passionate about that will foster the most meaningful connection to them. And Power allows us to connect with our clients and invest in the important girls in their lives. As a company that has a workforce of nearly 95% women and a client base of 100% women, Investing in girls' leadership was a natural fit for us and something that everyone has rallied behind. It is personal for me, our associates, and our clients. Second, be focused on the challenge you are trying to address and stay the course. We get asked to fund so many types of programs and they are all worthy of funding but we are committed to empowering the next generation of female leaders. Our call to action is, do you know a girl who wants to change the world? We engage our entire company in helping us do this, from our senior leaders to our field associates and our thousand stores. And lastly, find great partners that can deliver on impact. With great partners, you can find new ways to address old challenges. Elise Nelson and her team at Vital Voices are an extension of us. We share the same passion and commitment to change the world, one girl at a time. Thank you. So, wonderful example but it also raises a bunch of questions as we think about the front lines. Right? What's it going to take to change all of those classrooms that have math and science? What are we going to do at scale? How are we going to get to scale? If we're teaching women leadership and mentorship, what are we teaching them to deal with both the personal issues they care and passionate about and the systemic issues they're going to deal with over and over again? Right? So how do we have that Life, life of leadership, not just in these moments in these programs. Again, I just want to pull some of those out for our conversation that we're going to talk about. Right? Because each of us is trying to understand how do we work on these issues and how do we have the, half the population or the whole population find their voice in the way that she's finding her voice. This is our work today. But before we get to the conversation, I want to hear another example 
I'm going to introduce Eduardo Martinez, the president of the UPS Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor for me to be here with you, all of you today, and thank you for attending this very, very important session. And congratulations to Monica and Kate and Kay for all of your work. You know, service has been the hallmark of UPS over its 105-year history, and indeed one of our core values. It's entrenched in our more than 400,000 employees who live and work in over 220 countries. You know, last year alone, UPSers contributed over 1.8 million hours of volunteer service in their community. It's intrinsic in our people because these are their communities too, to make a difference, especially in the lives of young women. As a private sector global company, let me tell you the way we see it. The challenges are daunting for young girls and women. Women are often the first and most brutalized victims of discrimination, political strife, and war. Women are the fastest growing group of HIV AIDS victims. Women continue to be denied basic education, indeed basic human rights around the globe. Women are often left behind to fend for themselves and their children in times of famine, natural disasters, and economic depression. That's the dark side. But there is a very, very bright side, and we're seeing it today. Women are also the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the world. They're making great strides in gaining equal access to higher education. And in countries around the world, even in developing countries, they're leading nations. Let's face it, women are the glue that holds families together. They nurture the young and the old. They feed the hungry. They care for their neighbors. They are the heart and soul of every community in the world. As Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus would say, you educate a boy and you educate an individual but you educate a girl and you educate a community. Equipped with the right resources, women really do change the world. It's with this backdrop that UPS and the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts came together for this commitment. Just imagine a small town many miles away from Port Moresbury, the capital of Papua New Guinea. So small and remote that transportation to the capital is available once every few days. Now imagine two girl guides. Now in the United States, they're Girl Scouts. But just imagine two girl guides who have a dream of being part of a young woman's global forum, overcoming all obstacles to apply and be selected to participate in the meeting. These girl guides walked for two days to, from their hometown to apply for their travel visas. And one of the girl guides, Stephanie, said after the forum, it has truly been an amazing journey. And I'm truly blessed blessed for having attended. In 2010, UPS and the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, we affectionately call WAGS, committed $2 million to expand our partnership to empower girls to be leaders and advocates for change around the world. The membership of the Girl Guides is 10 million, and they will live in 145 countries. Our commitment has four parts and builds on a long-standing partnership between our organization. The first part is to provide girls and young women with leadership training that gives them the skills needed to become change agents within their communities and across society, as well as support others as mentors. The second is to develop an environmental sustainability training and advocacy program for girls. The third is to host global forums for young women addressing pressing issues that are pressing to them. Lastly, we are implementing country-focused programs of leadership development in Brazil, South Africa, and India. Since the start of our commitment three years ago, we have affected the lives of thousands of girls and young women. By complementing our programs with elite e-learning components, we have extended their reach by broadening our geographic scope and paving the way to reach multitudes more girls throughout their entire network over time. At the same time we are investing in learning, we value the incredible cross-cultural learnings that you have when you convene girls who are off the grid in global forums, so we are sponsoring these forums as well throughout the world. Another success factor has been fostering partnership with other organizations that have specific subject matter expertise and can provide the networks and platforms to advocate from. For example, this commitment has engaged the United Nations Millennium Campaign, 
and the UN FAO. As a global company, we wanted to ensure that our partner had an extensive global footprint and strong in-country presence. We have found that in WAGS, which has an unparalleled network of 10 million girls and young women from 145 countries. This enables us to mobilize UPSers wherever they are. Now I'd like to introduce someone who can talk about the experience firsthand. Fazili Kobo. I hope I did that right. Ah, you, you, you're very gracious. From South Africa is an advocate for environmental sustainability and gender equality. She holds a degree in community development and has been involved with girl guiding for 11 years. She represented WAGS at the United Nations Climate Change Conference. Fizeli gained valuable skills and opportunities there to champion change in South Africa and internationally. She's with us today to tell us how raising the voice, raising the voice of girls and young women promotes gender equality and creates a ripple effect of change around the world. Fizeli, we're honored to be here with you. We are so happy that you made this long journey. Please join me. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Fezile Ngobo from South Africa. Um, thank you, Ed, for the generous um, announcements, and I'm honored to be here today. I will speak about my experiences. Among many, I'll just state a few. Um, in part, I was part of the WAGS for 11 years, as, as Ed has said. Oh, congrats, Monica. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been part of the WAGS for 11 years, and throughout being part of the WAGS, I've learned and gained some experiences and skills that help empower young women. I think the one, one of the experiences that actually triggered me to, to take part in, in women empowerment is in my hometown, I live in a rural area. So in my hometown, um, gender empowerment so ge or female um, empowerment has never been dominance so it's it's always been male over females so um one of these one of the nights when i was at home say midnight a young lady who who has just had a baby and was diagnosed hiv positive walked in my home it was about midnight and she was crying and she had nowhere to to go to she had nowhere to sleep um her husband or boyfriend had apparently kicked her out so from that point on i, I figured that this has to stop this is, it's time for change. It's time for no more women violence, no more um, dominance over women. So that that's, has always been my passion. Um, I've, I've been holding events. I've, I've held a program called Celebrating Women's Day Every Day, where I teach and educate women about their rights and responsibilities. I give them life lessons, a place where they can come share um, and gain some, some experiences and gain some lessons where they can take home. Um, and above all, I, I, I've been advocating men in society to learn to respect women because it starts at the home. See, no matter what we do as our own, if, if the society and the men do not allow it, it will not happen. Above all that being said, I've also been part of an environmental sustainability project which are holding the townships. Um, these projects uh, consist of recycling, reusing, um, gardening, uh, gardenings which are more effective because they, on the economic side as well, uh, uh, we use it as commercially and, sustainab and sustainability in terms of we sell to local shops and whoever, because we live in a, a, a poor rural community, um, whoever cannot afford to buy would also eat from those gardens. So with the help of the UPS, we've, we've been able to, to, to generate these gardens in, in environmental sustainability. We've been able to learn um, we've been able to learn leadership skills, leadership skills among the women. We've been able to empower women, gender equality, and raise awareness across my, my community, across the KwaZulu-Natal province in, 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 um, in South Africa. So with that being said, I would, like, uh, to, I would like everybody to be aware of the problems and the challenges women are facing, especially in developing countries, and help us just like the UPS has been doing for the past few years. And that being said, I'd like to thank everybody for listening and taking their time.
And thank you, everyone. I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to cede my time to Alexander. Thank you. So this is actually your time. This isn't my time. I'll come back to you in one second. But I just want to point to incredible progress and examples in a multi-generational historical effort, right? And so we want to understand and from the most clear perspective for you on the front lines of this, what are the lessons you've learned in the last few months last year? What are the hard-won lessons? What are the beautiful insights? What are you learning about what it takes to do this work? Because everyone in this room, to some degree, is going to continue doing this after our next hour. So let's try and share those lessons. Zainab, did you want to say something? Please. There's a mic coming to you. Uh, so my name is Zainab Selby. I'm the founder of Women for Women International. In the spirit of CGI and how we can push this discussion forward, um, first, congratulations for the two companies. Uh, it's fantastic. But I actually have questions for the CEOs. For UPS, I'm curious how many women you have on your board, how many women you have in your management team, how many women drivers you have. For Ann Taylor, I'm curious how do you treat the women in your factories? Do you actually have track record? Do you pay them minimum wages or livable wages? And I'm talking about the factories in China or Bangladesh or wherever they are. In other words, I'm trying to lift the discussion from the symbolic support of women in developing countries which indeed have a lot of suffering and indeed need a lot of support. And Thus, the speakers, Monica and Fiesel, from the heart, and it's so wonderful. And, but that's not the full discussion. The discussion is in America as well, and is in the corporations as well. And we, it's not a them story. It's an us story in here. So how, what is the us story? And I'm curious, as two companies who have obviously taken a lead in investment in women's issues, what have you done in your own uh, internal strategies and internal businesses in terms of supporting women in leadership? Yeah. Great. Can I answer it? Okay. We have done a lot to support leadership issues for women. First of all, I'm very proud to say our board is 50% women. And we receive the New York Stock Exchange Award every year, which is exciting for me to accept. Um, we have a lot of issues, and we have a lot of programs um, around the world, and we absolutely value our factory workers and help them in many ways. And I'm going to turn it over to Paula Zuzai, who is our chief supply chain officer, who happens to be with us today, who absolutely, really takes care of the whole world for us from a product and sourcing perspective and logistics. Thank you, Kay. And it would um, be great to hear from you also, what is your front line? What is the thing that you're working on in the context of what you've done, and what are you working on next? So we can understand sure. what we're trying to push forward. So I just have to thank Kay because um, for what I do, I'm one of the only female chief supply chain officers in the retail industry. Um, and I, again, with Kay's support, she's empowered me to really look globally at our supply chain. And so one of the things we're doing is we're partnering with a company called BSR to run the HER project, Health Enables Returns. We can touch up to 100,000 women in our factories all over the globe by teaching them health, education, basic well-being, and now we're adding on to that and helping train these women for financial literacy. Many of these women have never had a bank account. They don't know how to access cash. They turn their paychecks over to their husbands or to their families. So again, when we empower women to make good health decisions and good financial decisions, it allows them to lead more productive lives. And we know uh, very much to your point about when you educate a woman, you educate a community. So we also are seeing the ripple effect in many of the communities that these women live in and work in. So again, it's an honor to work for Ann Inc., a company that really cares about the women not only in their company, but also in their global supply chain. And I also have to say UPS is one of our partners, and we have a great relationship with UPS, and I look forward to figuring out how we can work together to touch the lives of more women around the globe. So with that. Thank you, Paula, and thank you for the very, very Good question. You know, at UPS, we have a, um, a motto that says, we always remain constructively dissatisfied. And uh, over the years, <laughs> over the years, we continue to invest in diversity and developing women. In fact, that's where this commitment and our engagement internationally is all about developing women. 
in the transportation and logistics business is very difficult. It's very difficult to develop women. I've been with the company for 37 years. So I started loading trucks when I was 16 years old. So it's very difficult because we'd like to bring people up from the, the basic levels of the company so that they understand the business. And so we have continued to invest in women's leadership development internally. We have two women out of the seven and eight people that run our company internally are women. I work, I used to work as general counsel for a, a lady. And so, uh, but we remain constructively dissatisfied and we continue to focus on increasing our diversity throughout the world. Other responses to Zainab's challenge about how we're actually living this stuff and where is it hard to live this stuff? Yeah, Mike's coming to you. Yes, my name is Dr. Ruddy. I'm a surgeon. Um, I have a question. Um, let me just preface it by saying that I have a very open and tender and welcoming heart for young women. They're like my favorite people in the world. Um, but I would like to also say there are 45 million baby boomer women. Um, and some of us have been fortunate enough to percolate to the top. Um, but what could we do to try and recruit from among that uh, very vibrant, experienced, deep uh, pool of women to uh, empower them as well? The leaders are sitting there on <clears throat> a gold mine of experience and wisdom. Um, I'd like to be able to incorporate their voices into this movement for women's leadership. Sure. Coming in the back here. Hi, um, Alex Eaton. I'm from Mexico, and we we work with small farmers. And um, I I grew up with a really strong mom and lots of sisters, so female empowerment never seemed like it was an issue. I guess until I, <laughs> um, until I uh, got out in the rest of the world. And um, at at in at, at our company, we actually have a really really strong business case for promoting our technology with women technicians. So most of our field technicians are females because there's a interface with cooking fuels. And so we were able to make a really strong economic case, uh, but looking around this room, uh, it's mostly women here. And so there was a really interesting uh, point brought up by the young woman that men really need to be a strong piece of this conversation. And I guess in other sort of uh, fuel issues, renewable energy, water, sanitation, there's been sort of a pragmatic push to making a business case for these changes. And I guess I would, put this challenge out to the groups that are working on this. What could we do next year to have this room half filled with men who are part of the decision making and who, and I guess also framing this in a way that it's not men giving up power, but I really see a better society that's run with a higher level of female leadership. And I think we really need to work to articulate that rather than sort of wrestling power away. How is it that that power would be ceded voluntarily because of the benefits that it would provide. So I was just hoping that some yeah. people could comment. Men inclusion in this topic is not a new idea, right? I mean, that's been talked about for decades, right? And so why hasn't it happened more? I mean, I'm struck by the, 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 the number of CEOs in the Fortune 1000. How many is it? 35. 35, 3%. right? 3%, right? And that hasn't moved very much. And that hasn't moved very much, given all of our efforts, right? Right, and, and I think we have all the statistics. I'm not worried about the statistics. I think it's easy to make an argument and, what? I'm worried, I, I'm, wor I'm not, right, I should be, right? But that hasn't been enough. We can make the argument that small farms are better with women, right? So again, what are the lessons, the hard lessons that we're learning? What's the things we're gonna do differently to change this conversation? All right, let's get specific. Let's get sort of, yes, please. My name is Kathy Johnson. I'm a professor at St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. You can probably tell by my Lake Wobegon accent, right? So um, something that I've done and taken upon um, with immense passion is a mentoring process for two young women, Angel and Anastasia, who are here, who are women with disabilities. And this is something I'd like to you know, share with the foundations on when you're working on development of young women, if you can allocate a certain percent to ensure that you have women with disabilities who you're developing, especially in the developing country. Angel's a chief inspiration officer for the Angel Center. If you remember, she was here last year at the end of the closing ceremony. She's risen and um, attained a ton of skills and is one of the first women in China who has truly gone through um, transformative empowerment. 
Anastasia is getting her master's degree in human rights at the London School of Economics. And so how do we work together then also to have the voice of women with disabilities attain leadership roles and become CEOs of companies and make a difference in the world too? They're incredible young people. I encourage you to meet them. <laughs> Thanks. Right. Come on in front. Um, I'm... I'm Abby Disney, um, run Fork Films and um, the Daphne Foundation. And, and um, I see faces in the room of people who've been working at women's issues for a long, long time. And, and, and we all know, those of us who've been doing it for a long time, that there's been this kind of surge in energy in the last few years. And that's been really gratifying. Um, but the surge in energy has come um, with a certain reticence about the rights discourse. Um, and there's been a desire to make uh, the women's issues kind of user-friendly, not scary, not threatening. Um, and, and that's been good because we've been more welcoming to men, we've been more welcoming to more kinds of points of view, and that's all been a net positive. Um, but we do have a tendency to sell things as always a win-win. We do have a tendency to kind of gloss over some of the harder issues and stay with the more sort of attractive, easy to sell issues. And I mean, as I, it, it, India is a really interesting example. So India, India has been, you know, had a rising middle class. And as the middle class has risen, millions of people have done better, they've had more resources, and we've seen within their lives, many things change for the better for women, and we should all be happy about that. But, you know, instead of taking the girl baby and drowning her in the river, um, they're going and getting an ultrasound and aborting the girl baby. So the same thing is happening, it's just a middle class manifestation. Um, and that's because there really has never been an underlying conversation about the big issues of women's rights and women's human dignity and equality. So it may not be a question of men don't have to give anything up. It actually may be push may come to shove and men may have to give some of their entitlement up and we may not be able to always sell this as a win-win. And, um, and, and the reason I'm suspicious of the constant win-win dialogue and the idea that there's a business case to be made is that the minute you can prove that people aren't benefiting and everybody's not winning, people are gonna walk away from this. The minute it gets, we have to do this because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Because there's a human dignity question at the base of it all, and and I worry that all so this discourse. So what are you finding works? Winning. I mean, I, I, what what works? Because one of the things that's true is that if we do this at the rate that we're comfortable with, right. we're going to continue on the current trend, and it's not fast enough for exactly. men. Exactly. So how do, do how, do we get, how do we do that work? There's a 40-year study that was done among 70 countries that showed that the places where real progress has been made in women's violence against women, real concrete progress, have been the places, it hasn't had to do with income, it hasn't had to do with how many women in government, the only thing that was different in the countries that did well was a vibrant, lively, well-funded women's rights community that used the F word for itself on a regular basis. And you know, this is a 40 year study in 70 countries. It was the only thing that made a difference. So what we have is lots and lots and lots of big international NGOs doing work that is sort of palatable and easy to fund. And then we have this community of women's rights activists and they are starving. They are underfunded, they are dying. So I think that in these rooms, we need to kind of move toward things that make us a little uncomfortable, that trouble the water a bit, and let's not starve this community of activists the way we've been doing. Sure. Comment over here. Thank you. I, I couldn't help but just add something to what Abby Disney just said, um, in that um, recently, AWID, I'm sorry, I'm Nikki McIntyre with Mama Cash, and we fund women's rights organizations, and it's to get to this point of the lack of funding that is going to women's organizations. Women's organizations around the world um, are, are, are raising on an annual basis um, approximately a third of the 2010 budget of Greenpeace. So we're talking very, very little money, yet they have managed with such little money to achieve huge um, progress for women around the world in the last decades. Um, a very recent piece of research that was done by the Association of Women's Rights and Development, which is just about to come out, has shown 
and have welcomed all of the new players that have come to the table in, let's say, just the five, last five years. I'll be quick. Oh, um, and, and have brought together about $15 billion in new money. But hardly any of that is actually reaching women's rights organizations, which are tackling the kind of underlying issues that are coming at this from a holistic perspective, that aren't just seeing a quick fix. Yeah. And I think that gets to the issue when you say, well, what, what's, what are yeah. we going to do that's going to be different? So what, do you, what, are you find, yeah. so what are you finding is working, right, in trying to increase the number of money going to activists? And how do you do that, given Abby's point, that we can either soft sell it and make it warmer, fuzzier, easier, or deal with some of the harder issues that are underlying this? I mean, it's always interesting when you're in a room like this talking about this topic, how much are we laughing or crying? Right, given what's out there. So how are you finding what works? Well, I think of one of the things that four organizations here, um, Mama Cash, African Women's Development Fund, AWID, and the Global Fund for Women, came together and made a commitment at, this, at the CGI to say, we would like, over the next 12 months, to pull together several convenings that would try to bridge this gap between all of the new players coming to the table with really, really good intentions and help to see how we can have a closer dialogue and, and figure out things together with the private sector, the corporate sector, but, but beyond the corporate sector, um, and, 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 and see how we can figure out a way to make those initiatives, they're all really good initiatives, have even bigger impact because they have to broaden out further than where they are coming at this point, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's, it's a real challenge of how are we not just going to have a bunch of exhausted activists trying to do more with less. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rohini Anand with Sodexo, and Sodexo has 425,000 employees globally. I want to thank Zainab for actually starting us off on this dialogue because it is more about a systemic culture change across the world in all organizations. And I think it's important the leadership development role models um, for women is very critical, but it's beyond fixing the women. It's about fixing our workplaces and the cultures, and to do that, I think we need to have male champions. So you keep asking about what's working. Let me share with you two things that are working in Sodexo. There is a serious commitment from the top by the CEO, and he has actually established targets. So today we have 40% women on our board. We have 30% women on our executive team. And I think the other thing that's working extremely well in companies that do this is to have clear metrics linked to incentive compensation. So we actually have clear metrics on representation linked to bonuses. And trust me, uh, people pay attention. So two yeah. strategies at work and have really made a difference over the right, and it, past it's good to years. It would be good to study in that company why it worked. How can you have a quota or percentage in your company and so many others are not willing to do it? Right, so what happened there that allowed them to actually set that quota and meet it? Well, I, I think one, one quick thing, I think someone just mentioned about you know, making the business case and it's about the right thing to do. Yes, it is, it is about the right thing to do, but I think it has to be linked to the values and the mission and the business case of the organization. So for us, it's about innovation. It's about serving our customers. And as a result, I think there is an embracing of the targets and of the incentive compensation. So it makes sense. And it's not the only factor, but I right. think it's the drive from the top, the engagement at all levels in the organization, and clear metrics and accountability. And I think that's the piece we often forget, is the accountability piece. You can have all these lofty goals, but how do we hold people accountable for making the changes that need to be made in our organizations? Yeah. Comment over here, second round, then we'll come back. I'll come back to you. Hi, Chuck Denham, <clears throat> one of the men in here. Uh, i just like to say there's a huge opportunity that's just developing right now. Our area is healthcare, and women have an immediate opportunity to seize the levers of uh, control of the healthcare dollar. Here in our country, we're moving, we're in the, mo the most disrupted environment uh, that we've ever seen in healthcare. I'm on faculty at uh, Harvard uh, Medical School and also the Mayo, uh, Mayo Clinic College of Medicine teaching innovation. And right now, the opportunity for the levers 
for families to be able to be influenced by women making decisions on the healthcare dollar is just amazing. 80% of healthcare decisions are made by women. Uh, women, I call them the chief family officer, our, our greatest uh, CFOs in the world are women. So uh, there's a huge opportunity that is a new opportunity all over the world in low-income countries as well as the high-income countries to make decisions and now be able to vote uh, with your feet. So I think health And how, and how is that affecting you? Well, so, how are you living your life personally differently because of all this awareness? Well, so our commitment is called Care University. So we have Google, Sesame Street, Mayo Clinic. I was more interested in you as a Harvard. person, but yeah. Oh, so, well, I've put uh, the majority of my effort now into helping train uh, women care moms is one of our programs. One is called Care Kids. We have a million kids competing on innovations to help moms uh, be able to have an influence on emergency conditions. Our healthcare systems failed us. Uh, so there are emergency conditions in low-income communities around the world and in this country, huge number of things we can do to prevent uh, suffering and death through the women and through uh, moms. Now, what we've coupled it to is a certification program so yeah. they can earn college credits and credits with, uh, with payers. So both low-income communities around the world and in the U.S., huge opportunity because of this big disruption. So yeah. I think there's really good news on the way if, women will, if we help train women to make good health care decisions for their families. Uh, hi, Elise Nelson, Vital Voices. Um, just to build on what Abby said in full disclosure, huge fan of Abby's. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, I feel like in the last two decades that I've been working on these issues, we have gained, women have gained tremendous presence in societies and economies. I think the greatest unfinished business is how do we now seize power over societies and economies? And I feel like to do that, we have to make the next argument. So you talked about how, you know, I think about 10 years ago, the economic argument began to, to unfold. And we have all this data and research to prove it and the win-win. But I feel like women are more than just the economic force. We are a leadership force. We lead differently. And that difference is precisely what the world needs. But unfortunately, I've got all kinds of great stories I can tell you about, but I don't have any data to show that women's leadership actually makes a difference. And so I would say, you know, we think about what's next, mm -hmm. um, the data for why women's leadership, women actually having a stake of power is going to make a difference. And what do you think it would take to get that data? What's the problem? With Money. <laughs> and I think a commitment, honestly, from um, corporations to look beyond the economic argument. The economic piece is critical. You know, getting women into, into, um, into corporations, helping women start up, um, you know, businesses, that's critical. But also helping women get to the very top, right. you know, hold power. I mean, you know, we see the rise of women in parliament, certainly about 20% around the world, but I don't think we hold 20% of the power in right. parliaments, right? We have, we have some of the lower level seats. Yeah. So I think it's it's really investing in that. And, and for corporations, we're investing a lot of dollars right now in this space to recognize that it can't just be about economic development. You know, that women's leadership is going to bring something different and something very important as well. Okay. Coming over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Jacqueline Lundquist, and I work with a spectacular company called Water Health International that cleans water in the developing world. Um, we're in five countries, Liberia, Nigeria, Ghana, India, and uh, Bangladesh. I joined the company about three years ago, and I was the only woman in a board meeting, and it was kind of scary, I have to say. I took a, I, I spent the last two years traveling to the Clinton Global Initiative conferences, Tina Brown's conferences, and we've, you know, as if providing clean, safe drinking water to people wasn't enough good stuff, um, I made the company create something called WOW Centers, Women Operated Water Health Centers. Um, to empower the women, we employ them, 2,000 employees around the world. I don't know, Abigail, if they saw your spectacular movie, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, but I want to tell you a story. <laughs> So, we're, so the women in Nigeria, not Liberia, but um, we had some conflict in one of the communities where we were, and there was some um, uh, some rioting that was going on in the community. So the women came around, banded around, got all of them to s themselves as a human shield to protect the water health center, which was their most valuable asset in the community, and that saved the center. So, um, anyway, I just wanted to share some good news that's going on around the world yeah. in water. I mean, yeah. we got two comments in there. I'll come back yeah. to you. Yeah. In the middle here, we have two comments, just one right after the other, yeah. Right next to you. 
Hi, I'm Brittany Perkins. I work with the Disaster Relief and Construction Company. It's an industry that's all men. And I guess for the most part, and while I'm young, I do think it's really interesting how many times I'm called sweetie and I watch men stumble over, is it girl, is it lady, is it, you know, what to call me. And I'm a little, going off the comments in the front row, dis going, you know, I'm disturbed and I want to press. I hear a lot of the CEOs in these rooms and these companies talking about all the things we do for girls, getting more women, and what we do for boys, teaching boys in the community. And I wonder how much are we really integrating it in the men in the boardrooms, in the men in the management companies, and sorry to jump on UPS, through your supply chain, through the 16-year-old boys that are, are stocking your trucks and up. How much are we really doing, you know, and I say sexual harassment training, and I almost cringe because I, I know all those videos I have to watch every time I've had a job that no one looks at. How many times do you really sit around your rooms and, and use those uncomfortable conversations and say, this is your daughter? You know, this could be your daughter, not we support domestic violence or, you know, sex trafficking is, is the thing everyone likes to support now. But it, it's difficult to prosecute. And I have those cases because men with daughters don't want to convict because they think whatever, you know, that's a different story. So my question is, how much are the are the men in these rooms really in their companies making it their own issue of women's rights? It's, not, it's, it's a fair question. I interview a bunch of CEOs all the time. How much do you care about gender issues? How much do you care about diversity issues? And they will all nod and tell you that they care about these issues. They just don't care about it as much as they care of 17 other issues, <laughs> right? Job security, well being liked, being promoted, all of those things are more important. So I think it's a very interesting question and I'd love to get people from the room saying, what have you found that worked to get them to pay more attention to this, right? How are we actually gonna make that argument that they're going to prioritize it over every other pressure they have in the business. Because I think it's the right question. But we're up against a lot of other things competing for their intention. Yes. Um, hi. Hi. I'm, I'm um, Eileen Fisher, clothing designer, clothing company. Um, anyway. Oh, thank you all. <laughs> anyway, um, the hardest thing for me personally um, was raising two children and running a company. Um, and I think that a lot of women still struggle with those kind of choices. And I think there have to be better ways. Um, and I've been lucky to be able to do it my way. Um, you know, at a certain point, I decided I was just going to leave work at 3 o'clock every day because, you know, I wanted to be home with my kids, and I could do that. And what I found is that, you know, what mattered to me, that I could make those choices. And then I wanted the women who worked for me you know, and the men too, to be able to make those kind of choices. So um, some of it is flex time, some of it is, um, you know, the women who are having children, how, how can we help you? How can we do it better? You know, what do you need? Do you want to work four days? Do you want to go home early? And some of it is helping people to find out what they're passionate about, what their purpose is, and that, you know, we realize that, you know, even part-time work uh, can be, you know, really exciting and fulfilling, and some of our key executives don't even work 100% full time. So, um, I, I kind of think both men and women, there's a lot of opportunity for meaningful work that isn't driven, you know, crazy hours. And so, I think some new models of how we work. I, I just want to say one one thing that comes up for me that ties together with this is I was at a conference and I heard uh, that. I can't remember how many years ago, maybe a dozen years ago, um, in Holland, if anybody's from Holland, um, maybe you can help me answer if this is correct, but I heard that there was a time when uh, unemployment was really high, like 12% in, in the 80s, and then what happened was there was some convening of business people and a decision to make a lot of part-time work available, and that the, within a few years, the unemployment dropped to... So I kind of feel like there's some answer for men and women together, you know, at, 
I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly. And I want to say just one other thing, and maybe I've said too many things now. But uh, another thing that we do is because we find that women speak differently and um, often hang back, which I know came up in the Harvard study. In the, uh, and we have been for many years conducting meetings in circles, passing a talking stick. It sounds weird, but you know we have a lot of visual people and quiet people, and the women. Um, often you know won't speak and and so we find that uh, many amazing creative ideas come out of just making you know a space for everyone to have an opportunity to speak great can i just follow up on that example yeah then i'll come back to you thank you my name is rulfin kuipers and i work for deutsche bank and i've worked for um i've worked on wall street for the last 30 years and I would like to um, tie two comments together of the two previous speakers. First of all, I think um, one of the biggest issues underlying all women's issues around the world is actually something that Sheryl Sandberg talked about yesterday, which is stereotyping. I think, the, and, and I think this continues to be the biggest problem facing all women around the world is how we are being stereotyped. And I think. We have made no progress on stereotyping. So that's one comment I want to make. And I think to really make progress in the world for girls and women, we have to figure out how do we deal with the issue of stereotyping. My second comment I would like to make, not knowing Eileen Fisher, but being a fan of her clothes, there's another reason why I'm a fan of hers, and this goes back to both, both Hollywood and the fashion industry. Because when we think about stereotyping, one of the great things about the Eileen Fisher company is not just its clothes, but it's using older women and all kinds of different women in its advertising. Yeah. And we can all, we can all, you know, we can all, um, what's the word? Um, yeah, we can all relate to that. <laughs> and, um, and one of my biggest issues with the fashion industry, as well as with Hollywood, is that they seem to continue to promote the idea that we women have to look like 14-year-olds through our entire life, life cycle. And that's just not right. And the way particularly Hollywood portrays women so many times in very stereotypical roles is, again, not helping the image of women around the world. So stereotyping, I think, is a key issue. Mm -hmm. um, and all of us need to think about how we can potentially do something really meaningful to overcome stereotyping. Whether you are a little girl in India, whether you're a little girl here in New York City, whether you're a little girl in Amsterdam. Thank you. Sure. We have a comment up here. I just also want to highlight, and I don't know your story too much, but I'd also wonder what the risks is that you took and the strength it took to be able to change the way you work and to put other people in your ad campaigns and the feedback that you had to overcome to be able to do that. And I want to be conscious of the risks we're asking each other to take and the consequence and the skill set that we need around that rather than just being a good thing to do. And can we have an honest conversation of the cost and strength that's needed and the support needed to do that? Because we're not just talking about stereotyping here. We're talking about the lives in many other places around the world that's about abuse and then having basic needs met, not just sort of stereotypes of how people look. Um, in a lot of poor communities around the world, the way women find themselves is because they are stere stereotyped by the men, either for religious sure. reasons, social re reasons, all kinds of different right. reasons. So I, it's an issue everywhere. I'm, I'm totally agreeing with the issue. I'm talking about what is the skill set we're asking people to step out of a stereotype to act different with their husband, with their family, and their community, even wanting to say something. Yes. Um, I'm Sarah Costa and I work for a women's rights organization, a fairly small organization that actually works with refugee women and girls. And previously I worked for a large foundation and I spent many years or sort of on a different front line. And that front line is with very marginalized communities. I worked for many years in slums in Brazil and now in refugee camps. And two of the things I just want to put out there, one, you know, we need to be talking to the women to find out what they need. This is key. So when I ask women in a community in the south of Brazil what they actually need, they'll tell me something like, 
I need to know how to fill in the birth certificate so my child can go to school. I need to be able to know how to go to work, so I need the documents. Take me to the place where I can get the documents. So this is incredibly important to listen. But the thing is that these small things are a different entry point to women's leadership. I have seen women who've learned how to fill in these forms go on to teach a whole community how to fill in these forms, go on to build a recycling plant in their slum so they can generate income to actually build a little school and a health clinic. And recently in a refugee camp, one of the things that talking to women on the ground, they wanted to know how to participate in camp management. And so what is, what the two points I want to make is the entry point can be very different and can lead to very important changes. So it can be small and lead to something big. And the second point, key, is listening and talking to the women on the ground. And I think just um, going back to Nikki's point, the women's organizations, the women's rights organizations on the ground in the many of the developing countries are ideally situated to be able to do this work because they are located in those communities and they desperately need support as well. Thank you. Yes, no comment here, then we'll come to you second. I'm okay. Jim Greenbaum at the Greenbaum Foundation. I left the business world about 15 years ago to no longer make money but to try to lose it efficiently. Um, I want to talk about a few things going a little bit different approach than what Abby had mentioned with an alternative viewpoint. I initially started working trying to find the areas of the most suffering in the world where the need was the greatest, where the mainstream groups weren't working, and I ended up working a myriad of issues. It was human trafficking, slavery issues, uh, justice, land rights, uh, maternal uh, child health. It wasn't until a couple of years ago I finally realized I was doing women's rights work but it was actually human rights work, and it was one of the same. All the groups here, they're phenomenal groups. I, you know, I've turned from somebody that's funding projects to now funding the projects I'm passionate about and trying to raise additional monies for them as well beyond my own means. Another approach to reach them is don't approach it as women's rights. Tell them you want to help with land rights. You want to end human trafficking, equal access to jobs, healthy birth of children, um, access to good health care. Look at it that way, the men may have a higher chance of wanting to support those projects and fund them. Because if you tell them, we well, support the women's rights issues, a lot of them get defensive. Yeah. Look at it as a human rights right. issue. And so we have a great question of when is it okay to be, make them defensive too, though? Right? When do you come directly and when do you do a workaround? I mean, these are important questions that we do. That. Your comment then will come to you next. Um, Afshan Khan, I run Women for Women International. I, I think one of the challenges that we face now, and it probably follows from a, a couple of points that were made last, is not to see rights as divisible. Whether it's economic rights, social, political, or human rights, they're all interconnected. And I think one of the, um, one of the probably the novelties when Zainab invented the, the Women for Women program was it actually linked those rights together whether it's health rights, whether it's rights to uh, political participation, or whether it's economic rights, recognizing those three things are embodied in a woman and a community. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to get the success that you want to have, it's looking at it in a holistic approach. And so what do you do? How are you helping people see it holistically? Because it's easier for others to divide them so they don't have to deal with them. So I how do we actually do that? It comes back to the point of, one, listening to what the entry point is for women, because in different countries, they will be different pressure points. Mm -hmm. um, so that entry point is crucial. And it comes back to knowing the community you're working in and understanding what their needs are, and then framing that in the right way. And that's why I think when I go back to some of the work that's been done around you know, a larger scale talk about what is being done to empower women, when you actually look at the results, and I think it was a study from Mama Cash, that even so many more foundations are talking about the importance of women and girls. When you look at European foundation investment, it's only about 4% of that goes towards women and girls. So there is a need to actually align the rhetoric with the reality, and there is a need to actually also very comprehensively look at how do we not segment it out into different parcels, 
but really look at what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve and where are the best collaborations to get those outcomes. Okay. Coming over here, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Charlotte Bunch, and I'm here with the Association for Women's Rights and Development. But I have also been working for over 25 years in uh, leadership development uh, through the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers University. And I think the issue that I wanted to add to the discussion you, you hinted at when you talked about risks, uh, one of the things that we have found in working with leadership development and programs really similar to some of those described here is that the most important next step is how do we defend women against the backlash that comes to their leadership? And, and uh, that backlash is very real. Uh, it's all over the world. It's not only uh, in developing countries. We've done a lot of work with women living under Muslim laws and defending the women who get backlash there, but also in Central America, where numbers of women have been murdered and disappeared in part because they moved out of their homes and into work and factories and were seen as a threat. So for me, the, the second part of the leadership development is the support of the leaders, the activists, the women who are actually seeking to make those changes. And I think that even in microcredit, we've seen backlash of violence against women because of the power they get in their family. So, to, I, I don't by any means want to stop any of those programs. I want them to continue. But I think we have to talk more seriously about building the infrastructure with, I work with human rights organizations on defending women human rights defenders and with women's rights groups on how to build the social structures for defending the women who take this leadership. And for me, that's one of the main reasons why anyone concerned with leadership needs to also be supporting the infrastructure of women's and human rights movements because those leaders, they may occasionally just be successful, but they face all kinds of backlash, even in their own families, often most intensely in their own families. Um, and that's really, to me, the, the front line of leadership development is also sticking with those leaders uh, and supporting them as they try to make those social changes. Thank you. Come on, yes. Come back to you next. Hi, my name is Laureen Arbus, and um, I have five points. That's a lot, but they're going to be really fast points that I wanted to make. Thank you so um, much. I'm the first woman in the country to be head of programming for a network, and for quite a few years was the only woman. It's a huge problem, a huge issue, that media today still remains totally underrepresenting women. So the Women's Media Center and others are working very hard to take that 7% of women who report news and cover news and increase the number. I wanted to make the point to you that there is a tremendous amount of research. Some of it's coming out of, the, uh, out of Harvard, the Women in Public Policy Program at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government um, through the Women's Leadership Board there supports the research which more than will confirm why women make and how specifically and where women make the difference as leaders. Um, the third point I want to make is that Mary Clark mapped all of the foundations in this country. And the shocking, appalling fact is that I think it was under 10%, maybe much less, of those foundations support women and girls. Now, there's, it's true, there's some overlap, but she was very carefully able to siphon out that which would be dual, of dual in, uh, commitment. Um, and that's an area we all need to really work on is the foundation area to specifically focus on women and girls. And the final point I want to make is through my work as a disability rights activist, um, and I don't want to be sound patronizing, but the fact is, and I just need to suggest to everyone here as follow-up to Kathleen and to your comment, that people with disability, because it is such a lonely road, and very often they grow up with no friends and no one to talk with. Those who make it through academia have more resilience and more self-confidence and more belief in themselves and will contribute more than anybody else. Think about it when you're hiring. Okay. Come on over, yes. 
Hello, I'm Elisa Miller, CEO of PRI, Public Radio International. I just wanted to build on a couple of things. Um, I think the point about the news cycle is super important um, because it's a part of what people's perception of the world is. And to the earlier point of how do we bring in you know, men caring about the conversation, feeling like they have a stakeholder, I think we can't underestimate whether it's nonfiction and through journalism or whether it's through um, creative fiction, the power of storytelling. Data and numbers are powerful, but a story creates that personal connection. It creates a connection to the heart and to a way that then can motivate people to think differently. Um, and it feels to me like we need certainly in the news, but in many places, it can't be that the story about the women is the special thing. It's that the story about women just is the thing. And to me, that is a huge piece of this puzzle and how we can increase the amount of the stories that make that human connection is the key. Right. Comment in the middle, in the, yeah, about fourth row. Hello, my name is Michelle Ozumba. I'm the CEO of the Women's Funding Network, and we're a global network of women in philanthropy and a number of my sister allies in the room. And 80% of our membership is here in the US, and I just want to make a case for you all to invite US into the frame of global conversation. Increasingly, the face of poverty in this country is women and children. We have almost 30% of children in the US being born in poverty. And while poverty in the US is defined a little differently be, uh, in relative to other countries. Yes, our women are not walking to fetch water, but if I can't pay my bill, I still don't have water in my house, right? And so, um, you know, it's women in the uh, Women's Funding Network who, who lifted the veil of the invisible issue of sex trafficking of minors in this country. It started with the Atlanta Women's Foundation that uncovered it that the city of Atlanta was actually marketing itself as a place where any kind of sex is available. It had the highest number of retired professional athletes coming to Atlanta, uh, and it was an industry, and as a result of that, now we have sex trafficking in the US as part of the public agenda of concern and issues. So as I'm listening today and I'm relating to a lot of the comments here, I feel like the condition of women and children in this US is, is a missing part of this, and, we can, and the US, when we say global, we're global plus the US. I want to make a case that global includes the US. And it's not for any necessarily positive reason, but I think if we do it, we can get to a better positive result. Great. So thank you. Thanks. Coming over here. I'll come Hi. back to you. Hi, my name is Akank Shahzari. I'm the founder of Empani. And I just wanted to offer a kind of positive ray of hope of what I see as what will be a dominant industry in the future, which is social enterprise and social entrepreneurship, which I'm a part of, which actually is a female-dominated industry. The majority of founders in social entrepreneur uh, enterprises, tech minus technology-based or otherwise, are all women, or at least the majority of which are women. And interestingly enough, you know, before starting Empani, I worked in energy and other very male-dominated industries, and my team is primarily women, and it wasn't because I was trying to make a statement. It was simply because the best talent were women. And when social enterprise becomes the way we do business 20 years from now, because it will, I actually think women are the ones who are able to build businesses that have social goals. And that's why you're seeing, you know, we're not seeing it today, it's a very nascent space. But when 20 years from now, social enterprise is the way we do business, I think you'll see women in power. And you'll see most women at the heads of these companies being women and their teams being women as well, irrespective of whether it's technology, clean tech, or any other space. So I'd just like to offer that as kind of a piece of hope for you know, a, a longer timeline than we're envisioning today. Right. There's a comment behind you. Yeah. And I think we all face the challenge too. When do we build models outside of the models we have now, right? like social enterprise, and how are we going to change the existing dominant models? right? Let's come back. Thanks. Hi, I'm yeah. Jackie O'Neill with the Institute for Inclusive Security. Our goal is to get more women in peace processes around the world. And I want to pick up on Elise's comment about research and what data is available, because we're constantly getting asked, you know, how do you know it will make a difference when more women are involved? Where's your data? Where's your data? And it's very difficult to make a case when your sample size is close to zero. So 
what we want to say is give us more women in peace processes and we'll document the hell out of it and tell you what happens. But it's very difficult to, to produce the research when there isn't a practice. And so what I'd love to see more of, and um, the reason I'm sharing it with people in this room, is that we're constantly extrapolating from other industries. So talking about the impact of women around the boardroom table, the impact of women in social enterprise, et cetera. And I would love to see and be eager to hear if people are, if there are platforms for doing this, but sharing information from the private sector about what difference did it make to your company when you had more women around the table? What difference did it make um, in various other industries so that we can start drawing on that more and more because we're really struggling to find uh, research that's not just at a local or regional level, but at a national or a, a more quote unquote high powered level um, okay. that's going to be resonating with some of the policymakers we're dealing with. Thank Great. You. So stand there after this program and anybody who has that data should go over and see it to you. I think our relationship with data is something we actually could have spent more time on, uh, both because it's true we don't have the data, but if I don't want to do something, the first thing I'm going to do is say, give me some better data. Um, and so we want to watch how much we invest in this data, whether it's worthwhile doing or not, or it's just a workaround. You wanted to come back to a comment in front, and then we need to begin to wrap up. So Zainab and I are going to do a tag team thing. Okay. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit um, uh, of, of a buzzkill right now, and I apologize for that, but everyone who knows me knows I'm a buzzkill every day. Um, um, so, so I, okay, here's yeah. the story. Let's just, I mean, I'll make it fast. No, I don't, I don't mean to make it fast. I yeah. mean, these are the people on yeah. the front lines. I want so to what, make it concrete. What does this group need? And I'm trying to make this as concrete as I possibly can. So it has to start with an anecdote, though. Um, Lema Bowie, the Nobel Prize winner from a couple of years ago, and I went together to show film and to talk about women's leadership in the Congo. And we're in Goma in the fancy hotel. There's always a fancy hotel in the most godforsaken places on earth where you can get a good glass of wine because you work for an NGO and you drive a white SUV. Parking lot full of white SUVs. Lema hears something in the middle of the night. It's a woman, not really a woman, a girl, 14 at the most, who has been pushed out of a room um, completely naked. And she's yelling at this man and saying, you have to pay me, you have to pay me. Um, so she comes out of her room and tries to help the girl. All the other doors in the hallway open and male heads pop out, all white. They watch this woman, they do nothing. The security comes along, they beat this woman. The police come, they put her in the trunk of their car and they drive away. Um, so <laughs> I, we all know that most men, the vast majority of men are good, decent, wonderful people and we love them. Um, so they're not perpetrators but I think the vast majority of men are tolerators. Um, and tolerating needs to start being the problem. We need you guys to start stepping up and recognizing that even though you do not commit violence yourself personally in your life, you exist within a continuum of violence. And if you don't push back on your friends and the people around you, if you don't walk out of the stupid bachelor party when the stripper walks in, if you pay your money for that movie, if you take your son to that movie, if you don't push back on each other, there is no bout of marching and taking back the night that we will ever be able to do to make this thing change. So that's my concrete ask of the men in this room, because we can't do it. We can't talk to men about this. We have talked till we're all blue in the face. They're sick of it. They need to hear it from each other. I need each of you guys to promise. <laughs> to, just say to yourself, I am going to say something five times between now and December 31st. That is my promise to myself. I'm not going to let it slide anymore. Okay. Then I would invite you to say something to all the men who chose not to come to this session. <laughs> Zainab, let's get your comment, then I have to begin to wrap up. Um, well, every time I attend a woman discussion, I feel we start with a focus and then we go with a million ideas. It's uh, we need to address this idea and this idea and this idea, and all of them are valid. And and none of them, it, it's not. There's no secret, you know, uh, sauce for what do we do to solve it. Every single idea is valid here. But we need, for me, to go back to the practical. So once I heard a senator at the Mexican Senate who was at the Finance Committee at the Senate, and she says, when I was the only woman at the Senate, at the Finance Committee, I never argued for women's related issues. But then when there were three women and then five women. I started having more confidence and I started actually arguing. So a few things that I take from this session is 
it's very frustrating and maybe because I am from that part of the world to make it a third world women's issues. It is not a third world women's issues. Women's challenges is a global challenges and it, it has to start, any discussion to be accurate has to start with home. So my philosophy is I cannot help another woman if I do not tell her my story first. So what are the things that we can do at home? How can we get women CEOs more from 3% to 50% really? Because you can do that, I cannot do that. And how can we get more board of directors at UPS who are women? It has to start at home and this, so there's no one secret sauce if we each look at our own companies and our own, if I am a politician, where have I really interviewed women and not one of them as a symbolic figure representing all womankind. And we have Hollywood in here. And I just like, I just learned, I just learned that actually the real story behind the princess and the frog is that she never kissed a frog and he never turned into a prince. She threw him off the window. That's the real story. I feel like I need to walk in the street and say she threw him off the window and that's when he turned into the frog, which talks about the stereotypes. But I mean, how can we each do something in a our own sphere, wherever we are in our sector, and volume matters. Having more women at any one issue does make a difference, and this is above and beyond data. Great. So I need to begin. Thank you. So let, we need to end this given our time, but I think the challenge well said to all of us is not just for the men, but for us. What is the five things we can do from Zainab's point to start at home? What are those five things? And we challenge you with that. We want to end with two things. One, we have a tradition here of always ending with some commitment announcements. So I'm going to hear from two commitment announcements in a moment just to talk about some good work that they're doing. And normally what we do is we ask the CEOs to give the last thought. But rather than doing that, I'm going to ask Monica and Fazile to give the last thought after we hear from our commitment makers just as a shift to do it differently. Sarah Costa, and I'm the executive director of the Women's Refugee Commission. And as soon as a girl is displaced, forcibly displaced, her risks skyrocket. She's preyed upon by those she encounters when she's fleeing and those she encounters when she arrives. She risks sexual violence and exploitation. She's exposed to trafficking and she's exposed to a forced early marriage. She's unlikely to be in school. And her risks are even greater in urban areas where currently more than 50% of refugees reside. We can change this. We know that with the right support, adolescent girls can improve not just their own lives, but the lives of the entire community, and we've been hearing that. Through this commitment called Protect and Empower Adolescent Girls Affected by Conflict, the Women's Refugee Commission will build on our earlier research in refugee camps with girls in refugee camps from around the globe. And we will now research the specific needs and risks faced by displaced girls in urban areas throughout India, Ecuador and Uganda. And we're collecting the evidence base to be able to shape the guidance and the technical assistance needed for the humanitarian community to better protect and empower refugee girls. They are very resilient and they need good support. Thank you. My name is Gary Haugen with International Justice Mission, and we're an international human rights agency. We have about 600 full-time staff across the developing world working on issues of violent abuse of the poor. And just to comment, the vast majority of our senior executive team are women. And I would just reflect uh, on the comment that was made earlier. Um, what we see coming up through, especially through our internship program, we have about 60 interns a year, uh, and the vast majority are women and they're just so much more impressive than the men who apply. So I think the future professionally, uh, the, the talent pool seems just so dominant in these fields of law, in communications, marketing, executive management. So the, the future that I see is, is, is promising. Um, I would say that our, our commitment that we must want to update um, you all on today is that um, we have committed two years ago to a project in the Philippines, in the city of Pampanga, 
in collaboration with an amazing woman leader who's the Minister of Justice in the Philippines, Leila uh, Davia. And um, uh, this is a program that is setting out to reduce the sex trafficking of children in the city of Papanga by 40% over a four-year period of time by partnering with local law enforcement to actually provide a credible threat to those who, who traffic. Uh, this is an attempt to replicate a project that we did in the city of Cebu, another center of sex trafficking in the Philippines of children, uh, where outside auditors documented a 79% reduction in the victimization of girls in the commercial sex trade over a four-year period of time. So we're committed to replicating that, and I just wanted to update you. Uh, we've been able to now uh, work with the uh, Philippine uh, local authorities and local NGOs to establish a specialized task force of law enforcement that now in the first 14 months has been able to bring rescue to 79 confirmed victims of sex trafficking in Ponga and perhaps more importantly or just as importantly uh, to um, uh, bring a, a secure uh, formal charges against 35 sex traffickers who are operating uh, in those cases. Uh, we're going to push through to prosecutions on those, and many of them are facing life imprisonment uh, for those uh, offenses. The project does three things. It trains and empowers the local law enforcement to carry out this casework. Secondly, it rallies the community to make sure we actually enforce the laws. And then thirdly, it ensures that there's long-term excellent aftercare for the survivors of this abuse that must go on for years and years to see them restored to strength. So there are so many complicated issues, uh, but we want to at least begin to um, raise the hope that the violence against women and girls, even in countries that have a history perhaps of dysfunction and corruption and abuse within law enforcement, law enforcement can be made to switch sides to begin to protect the women and girls rather than protect the criminals who abuse them. And this for us is a sign of hope. So thank you very much. And I've asked both of the commitment makers to stay, so if you're interested, you can come up and learn more about their projects. Please give us some closing remarks. Um, so first, I just wanted to start off and say thank you so much for having us here. Um, one thing about this conversation in particular that was so incredible to me was the, the focus on the practical. Um, so while there was beautiful rhetoric, there was also a lot of commitment to action and a lot of specifics. So I leave here today not only inspired by all of these women's empowerment initiatives like Ann Power and the UPS Foundation and many others that were mentioned, but I'm also given a direction. And so I'm, I have a, a well-defined problem and I'm given these practical solutions to go get it. And I think that's what's pushing forward um, women's leadership, not just fluff. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful to hear that so many companies are willing to help young women and girls. Um, um, I would just like to say that I'm going to go back with good feedback and tell the young girls that I'm working with, and boys, since I'm working at the grassroots level, that there are so many people that are willing to help us. Um, and I would like to just uh, tell private sectors or let private sectors know that I think you should, let, you should um, hold NGOs or civil societies accountable uh, because when you fund them economically, they need to know, you need to know what have you done. Hence, with that being said, we are held accountable. That's why I'm here today standing and telling you that I've been teaching young girls and young boys um, at, at a very young age. That's where it starts, at the grassroots level. And yes, I have been doing this. That's why I'm here today, and that's why it's being effective, because the, the UPS is, ho is holding us accountable, and the WAGS is also holding us accountable at grassroots level. So we are producing because there is accountability that we need to hold. So um, with, in, with uh, private sectors in funding, just hold civil societies accountable and they will deliver because of the pressure. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thanks for your work pushing the front lines forward. Let's keep pushing. Thank you. Thank you.